Good morning, everyone. It's the beginning of a very special week on the Christian calendar. So we should all be smiling, especially with the weather that is before us. Um, we're moving on this morning as from last week. Um, we were looking at um, the chapter in John chapter 11, uh, Jesus anointed at Bethany. And today we will be looking at, yes, the triumphal entry. I suspect that some of the members uh, might um, have been at Murrayfield uh, recently or certainly watched uh, the rugby on the television um, as we recently completed the Six Nations Rugby Internationals. It was quite a, a good season for Scotland. They've often managed to take up the wooden spoon. But if you had done so and watched that, you would have sometimes seen time stand still for a moment. And these were on occasions when the referee was not quite sure of a decision as to whether, for example, to award a try. So he defers to the TMO. I wonder if you know what the TMO means. Well, it's the television match official. And he looks at it um, for clarification and confirmation. You see, the TMO, unlike the referee, is able to look at the incident from at least four different camera angles. And in a sense, that's the case this morning as we look at the triumphal entry. As this account is told to us in different ways in the, all four Gospels. The name itself, of course, the triumphal entry, is seen by some as a bit of a, a misnomer given the way circumstances transpired. Some may indeed say that it was a tragedy, not a triumph, but it was God's way. The Palm Sunday spectators were to witness the commencement of the most life-changing sequence of events ever to occur in the history of the world. And yet, in the end, they abjectly failed to understand God's ways and God's will, despite the fact that a prophet of old had very clearly told them of the coming Messiah. We'll take advantage of the, the narrative of the Synoptic Gospel writers in due course, but our pastor um, has prescribed for us this morning that which is written by his namesake, John. Maybe that's why he chose that one. Or maybe the fact to keep me shorter, because it is far shorter um, than all the other, other counts. It's in John chapter 12 and verse 12 to 19. But before we do so, uh, let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word and for all it contains and all it means to each one of us. We thank you that we can read it in public without fear or retribution and take this opportunity to pray for those for whom that privilege is presently denied. And we pray now that as we reflect on that first Palm Sunday, that you will clear our minds of the minutiae of the moment and through your Holy Spirit guide us to see ourselves as where we are on our Christian journey and be open to be pointed in the direction that you would want us to go. And we bring all our prayers before you in Jesus' precious name. So John chapter 12 and verse 12, the triumphal entry. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting what we've been hearing about. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him? Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone 
after him. I wonder if you have ever thought what it would be like to be so good at a particular activity that so no one else in the world could match you and the world could see just how good you were. Were my mind to wander in such an absurd direction, my choice would be to run the marathon in the Olympic Games. And the one that's forever stuck in my mind, shows my age a bit, was the one when I tuned in to the Rome Olympics. And watching that longest of races, at the time unaware that its historic significance in that an East African was winning that part of the continent's first ever gold medal, and barefoot as well, the athlete was one called a baby Bikila, somebody might remember him, of Ethiopia. And then in Tokyo, four years later, having had an appendicectomy only six weeks earlier, and with no one expecting him to even turn up, he lined up again. And this time, he stayed with the field for the first 15 miles, and then, just up the ratchet, moved away from the pack. And by the time he reached the, the, the stadium, there was nobody else with him. He was well out in front, and at the end, then, he performed some press-ups. In a sporting sense, what a triumphal entry that was, with the stadium rightly um, standing um, to applaud. It was a fantastic time for that particular time, but like most records, it was eclipsed in years to come. The triumphal entry to Jerusalem, of course, um, on which we focus on this Palm Sunday, is of infinitely greater significance. And was not just right for that time, it was right for all time. The timing was exactly as God intended. As Romans 5 and 6 tells us, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ came to die for the ungodly. God sent Jesus with the sole purpose to die to redeem a lost world and was of such historic significance that the implication of Jesus' arrival are as relevant today as they were on that first Palm Sunday. This event was Jesus finally going truly public. Not the beginning of the end as some saw it, but the beginning of all new beginnings. Divine intervention for the salvation of a fallen world. Jesus' purpose in riding into Jerusalem was at last to make public his claim to be their Messiah. On this special day, Jesus would ride into his capital city as a conquering king, and he would be hailed as the adoring crowd as such. The streets of Jerusalem, the royal city, were open to him, and like a king, he ascends to his palace. Not a temporal palace, but the spiritual palace that is the temple, because his is a spiritual kingdom. He receives the worship and praise of the crowd because only he deserves it. In the past, he's told his disciples to keep things quiet at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, which, like our study today, is the only miracle recounted in all four Gospels. And in John's account of that miracle, he states that the people wanted to make him king at that very juncture. But Jesus said, no, my time is not yet. The lesson being there that the people then and ourselves now must always wait on God's perfect timing. But now that particular day today has at last arrived. Jesus appointed time and now he's openly declaring to the people that he was indeed the king and the real Messiah on whom they had been waiting. And their generation had that privilege and opportunity of being in his holy presence at the beginning of this historic week. So how would the people interpret and acknowledge the claim that Jesus indeed was the Messiah? And what would be their immediate and eventual verdict? 
John is the only writer to report on the raising of to life of Lazarus. And the implications of that miracle would be very much in the minds of the people. In human terms, it all added to the excitement for the masses of the people already milling around during Passover time. To try and imagine the crowd scene, I suspect it would be a bit like expecting hordes of people in the roadside as the riders pass through the outlying villages in the Tour de France. This procession, however, would be much more concentrated and much shorter because the actual road um, from Bethany to Jerusalem, we are told, is only a few miles, but very uphill. The procession would be slow. The people would have plenty time to witness not just the king of the mountains or an earthly king, but the king of all kings, the son of the almighty God. Yet, in their minds, the king was only someone to rid them of the Roman occupation and bring back their freedom. Their thinking was far off the mark as a consequence. Their cheers would, as we know, be short-lived. Of recent times, recent, Jesus had been keeping a rather low profile in the desert area of Ephraim, knowing that the Pharisees were plotting to kill him. In the last few days, he had returned to Bethany, the village in which Lazarus lived. It was eventually to be the place from which he ascended back into heaven. Bethany was a place he loved. But for this particular week, the news was out. The crowds were on the march. They were out and about on this annual pilgrimage to the temple. And as an extra, albeit they weren't aware just how significant an extra, they were wanting to see the miracle man and wanting to see the Messiah, the Son of the God of miracles, Jesus himself. Traditions were very much part of the Jewish faith as they, as they still are in synagogues today and are manifested in the way that the crowds went out to meet Jesus, spreading palm branches on the road. And Luke records that they also spread their cloaks, which was a tradition reserved for royalty as the Israelites of old had done for Jehu. Quite funny that Jehu come up, he comes up today there in that one in Kings, and he came up at the prayer space a couple of weeks ago when John Burns was speaking. Um, he was somebody who was quite good king, better than some, but not quite what God intended. And he, it was all arranged by Elisha the prophet. Uh, that was an, an, old coronation, an Old Testament coronation action, but of course was of no consequence compared to the significance of the fulfillment um, of the words of the later words of another prophet, Zechariah, chapter 9 and 9, a passage that we've studied recently. And there we read, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding, riding on a donkey. Note that deep there in that minor prophet, the word salvation is mentioned in that verse. And of course, salvation was the very key to the whole purpose of Jesus coming as a, a baby to Bethlehem these 30 or so years before. He was now about to embark on that journey to fulfill that very prophecy and bring that salvation, not just to the Jews, but to Jew and Gentile alike, the world then and the world now. John's record of Jesus' mode of transport doesn't go into any detail at all, remembering that the other three Gospels, by their style, treat the story of the life of Jesus very, very differently from John. And they go into much more revealing detail than the words of ours. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. But God's preparation and example is always exact and complete. It is recorded in the other Gospels that Jesus sent two disciples to find and collect the donkey. And if anyone asks why, say, the Lord needs it. And should the owner ask if it will be returned or just be abandoned after you say it will be sent back shortly, says Mark. So there we should note again that amidst the euphoria of it all, it showed the care and concern for the animal that Jesus had. So then, how much more 
would he make provision for us as God's children, made in God's likeness. In Hebrews, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do take hold of that promise this morning, particularly if for you these are dark and difficult days. Jesus is on his way then, sitting on the colt, onwards to Jerusalem, onwards to his destiny. What was the reaction of the crowd? At face value, at least, it's a strange-looking sight. They're shouting, Hosanna, as we've been hearing, a word the people knew as that explanation of joy and praise and was used at festivals such as the eminent Passover. Although the actual word, we're told, only occurs in Scripture in the triumphal entry accounts. It has that original meaning of save us, deliver us, as indeed the people of Israel had been many times in the past when they had strayed. It echoes of that's another psalm there, 118, verse 25. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And yes, he is in the line of David. And yes, he is the Messiah on whom they were waiting. But as we said, not to rescue them from Roman occupation and oppression of the present, but to save them for time and for eternity. Hosanna in all likelihood for these people, misguided as they were, meant praise God and his Messiah. We are saved. How correct, if only it had been genuine. Yet despite all the signs they didn't remotely understand, or indeed in reality, the disciples did not understand either. For a while, verse 16, it states, it was only later in John 14 and towards the time of Jesus' ascension that he states, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I have said to you. Let's touch for a moment just on the three different groups standing by. There are the ordinary people. There is the band of disciples. Then there are the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees. They were becoming increasingly agitated. They were carefully following Jesus' ratings. His celebrity status was going viral, to use one of today's terms. It spread rapidly of all the miraculous deeds that he was doing, especially this raising of Lazarus from the dead. The crowds are in march because of the festival, but no wonder there's such concern amongst the authorities. What can they do? You can feel the panic in the words in our final verse there. See, this is getting us nowhere. The whole world has gone after him. And if only that were true then and now. They had given instructions if anyone knew of Jesus' whereabouts, they should report it. And Jesus would be arrested. Indeed, they planned to kill both Jesus and Nazareth and Lazarus, as in verse 10 of our chapter. At this juncture, the flames of messianic expectation had really been set alight. The Pharisees, concerned as they were for their own preservation, and Matthew and Mark states that they couldn't intervene during the feast, or that would have caused a riot amongst the followers. Luke tells us that the Pharisees asked Jesus to rebuke his disciples, but Jesus refuses. It was not for them or for us to question the will of God. Luke goes on to say that as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he looked over the great city and cried over it, knowing that the reaction of the crowd was momentary and superficial, and the day of Israel's destruction was imminent. He knew, too, what lay before himself in the next few days. Further distress in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the culmination of the purpose of his first earthly mission. And then as now, only God knows the future for this world. And he alone knows the days of that second return of his son. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And this first Palm Sunday, Jesus came in peace, in humility, on the fall of an ass. People had been expecting, looking out for the deliverer. Not from sin, but as we said, from Roman rule. Blessed is the King of Israel. These people in their misguided enthusiasm missed the entire purpose of his first coming and of his sinless life. 
and this significant journey. And sadly, they missed the opportunity which would emanate from his sacrifice. But the day of Jesus' next return to this scene of time will be oh so different. Yes, still the King of Israel, but so much more. Revelation tells us in chapter 19, I saw heaven standing open and before me, this time not a colt, but a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, and in his robe and his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That will be a triumphal entry, transcending every triumph ever accomplished. But for those and those alone who are recognizing him as Savior and as Lord, and who have availed themselves of that same salvation as prophesied way back by Zechariah. The four accounts of the triumphal entry tell us virtually nothing of individual people by name. Yes, the disciples were there, some soon to doubt him or betray him. The two who went for the cult are not even named, nor indeed the owner. Some of the disciples eventually go on to do great things for the kingdom. However, once that Jesus left them to do the work. What of these onlookers who brought that adoration in the road and who followed on that considerable upward slope to Jerusalem? Within a few days, what were they going to shout? Crucify him, crucify him. After the feast and the crucifixion, these same souls would have made their way homewards. Much to talk about as it had been very different from previous years and a bit more interesting. But for them, it would appear only that. As the journey to Jerusalem had been uphill and upbeat with all its possibilities of liberation, the road home was downwards in every sense. They had failed to realise that they had just witnessed the most important time in history. And when they reached home and closed their doors, they would have unwittingly closed their doors in Christ. They would doubtless have continued their old ways on the everyday road of life with all its worries and uncertainties. Perhaps a few even saw the risen Christ a little time later and believed because for the last time he may have passed their door as he returned with the disciples to that great favorite place of Jesus, as we mentioned. He returned, we are told, to the vicinity of Bethany. And there he blessed them, and then he left them. But not alone. The words of the great hymn by Melody Green put it much better than I could. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. The disciples continued upwards again to Jerusalem, full of great joy, making their way to the temple, worshipping and praising God as we have this morning, and would do so until one day their work on earth was done. But as God's people, and as we await the return of the Lamb, we are the disciples of today. And that begs the question, where are we today on the road of life? Are we as worthy ambassadors? There's a song by an American gospel group who have toured Scotland in the past called Signature Sound. And one of their numbers has this chorus, Oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Well, I can't explain it and I can't tell you why, but oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. What difference, I wonder, has Jesus made in us and by us as we travel onwards on the road of life and on to the open road as in God's will we will do tomorrow? We didn't have the privilege of affording the people that day um, of seeing Jesus as he was as yet. But I pray that we have availed ourselves of that salvation and started on that narrow road and left behind the wide road leading to nowhere and spiritual oblivion. Perhaps you're on the narrow road, but have recently been encouraging the ups and downs of the journey of life and are currently stuck in one of the many ruts on that winding road. 
and are struggling to get out. The prayer ministry team, as ever, will be available to listen and pray with you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He will lead you along that difficult road. Perhaps you're here this morning, and indeed most mornings, but just ambling along, enjoying the quiet country roads of life. Yes, attending church regularly, enjoying church, the worship, the fellowship, and then slipping away and spending the rest of the week in the spiritual lay-by of life. God wants so much more for us, doesn't he? That's why he left the Holy Spirit to be our sat-nav and point us in the direction that he wants us to go and to serve him with the gifts that he has bestowed upon us. Jesus, in his final instructions, told us to go make disciples of all nations. Yes, it could be across the world, but there's a mission right across our road. Do our neighbours know that we are followers of Jesus? I suspect as you set out for here this morning, there were not many others in the proximity of your house making their way to worship. In the 20 homes around you, perhaps at best one other family and you. As Jesus approached the city of Jerusalem on that first path Sunday, as we previously mentioned, Luke tells us, that he wept over it. If Jesus had been coming over the hill on Stocky Muir Road this morning and looked over our great city, I'm sure he could have wept over it too. Our city whose motto once said, let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of his word and the praising of his name. And of course, you'll no doubt be knowing that it's now curtailed to just let Glasgow flourish. The people in that time and on that road to Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday were soon to reject the claims of Jesus and shout, crucify him. We too live in a day, wherever we look, by and large, people utterly reject the claims of Christ. And as a consequence, ignore the instructions for holy living as contained in Holy Scripture and do so to their peril and to their cost. God was and is well aware of that scenario. And he inspired Peter, who would have been there on that Palm Sunday and who had several mishaps along the Lord of life, as we all do. And he later wrote that in these last days, scoffers will come following their own evil desires, saying, where is Jesus coming that he promised? Everything goes on the same way since the beginning of creation. Friends, as his children, we know God does keep his promises, but he's patient, anxious that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yet we know too that he will not always delay his return. And in light of that knowledge, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, it is our duty and our privilege to fulfill the Great Commission of sharing our faith with those with whom we come in contact, and indeed, surely all the more, as we see the day approaching, which could be very soon. Let us pray. Our God